at Gardening, Preserving, and Learning, a 25-minute show keeping you in the know. I'm your host, Joy Barrett. This show is presented to you by the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and by the Garden Hub, a new segment on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener website where a collection of gardeners from around North America has gathered to share information from container gardening, traditional ground gardening, and even hydroponic gardening. We traveled to Northern California to meet with a garden coach, backyard gardener, and all-around knowledgeable, growing woman, Jennifer Hammer. Welcome to the program. Hi, Joey. How are you today? Doing wonderful. I thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and not only being on the program, but bringing the program into your garden. Oh, you're welcome. I thought it was such a nice day, and my Wi-Fi came all the way out here, and I just thought we would have a nice view to look at while we chatted. <laughs> Thanks for having well, me you, on your show. You're very, very welcome. Now, there's you've got a couple of different uh, web places where people can visit, Recycling, Garden Mom, Blogspot.com. That'll be in the show notes following live broadcast. Jen's Gardening Spot, Blogspot.com as well as Jen's, G-E-N-N, -E -N, possibly as Gardening Spot. That's on Facebook. All those will be in the, live uh, in the show notes following the live broadcast. Uh, like you were telling me prior to the show coming on, you, you do have some uh, problems keeping up to date, but you're a very busy woman, and I want to bring up that question. You're a gardening coach. Now, yep. tell, me, tell me and tell those who are watching what a gardening coach is, and two, if you want to be a gardening coach, how easy is it to become one? Um, I do I do mostly vegetable gardening, so I do vegetable garden coaching. So I assist a lot with the Sacramento County to where I help them start off new gardens for school gardens and other community gardens and stuff like that. And basically I coach them. I tell them how to do it, how to start, what types of soil to use, what types of seed, when the best time to plant. So I really try to make them be very hands-on along with me and I'll show them and then I make them do one on their own. So it's kind of a, a process of I think that if you get your hands in there and do it, you learn more and you become more knowledgeable about it. Um, all I have for my credentials is just being a backyard gardener and I have started the process of trying to get my master gardener but basically if you just give yourself a, a good reputation and volunteer your time in different places people will you know listen to what you have to say and try to learn from you and I even do a couple of clients in the springtime and get families started in starting their own vegetable plots because I think everybody should grow their own food front backyard containers wherever you can find a place to grow and I think everybody has the potential to grow somewhere in their yard or in their house. And that was my question, your gardening coach that's totally different to a master gardening certification. You've just kind of taken this on yourself because you saw a need and you have the avail availability to help those who have that need or that desire to grow. Exactly. I, I'm very passionate about people growing their own food. I have a young child who has had some um, difficulties in growing. She has a couple of illnesses and she has to have, rely on a gluten-free diet and different things like that. So no processed food. And so this was my way of starting. You know, I really just educated myself, watched a lot of programs, read a lot of books, and I've been doing my own backyard gardening for about 11 years. And I just, and it, my family's healthier for it. And we don't eat a lot of processed food. I mean, we still eat some because it's hard to omit all of it, but we're doing our best to get rid of it all. Right. And having a gluten free diet, even for a healthy individual, may not be a bad decision to uh, look into. Right. So let's talk about you've got uh, you've got a great blog and you have a lot of recycling items that you use in the garden, much like we do here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens. Mm -hmm. You know you don't want to throw it away because you can use it somehow to, to grow food. And and talk about uh, some of the unique items that you use. Now one of them being rubber tires. Now this may be a controversial topic mm -hmm. based on some people say the toxicity in the rubber and everything but you use it. It's in one of your blog spots. Talk about some other things you use and, and why you use what you use. 
Well, actually, I, I do no longer use tires to grow food. <laughs> um, that was the early, you know, kind of when I wasn't as knowledgeable as I am now. I do grow mostly like ornamental flowers and different things like that in, in my tires now. And I, I do cut them up and make pots out of them and paint them a different color and just put flowers in them. I mean, it, I, it's a personal choice if you want to grow food in them or not. Some people say it's not bad and some people disagree. So I think it just becomes a personal choice. I use a lot of pallets in my garden. I built a fence around my entire garden because I have a new puppy and everything I plant, she digs and plants somewhere else. And I also recycle. I have old bed frames and futon pieces that you could probably see in the background. And I just made trellises for beans and cucumbers. I'm, if I can make it grow vertical, I will use it. And I just love trying to make things out of nothing into something, especially trellises. Right, and, and that's the thing. I'm sure much like you as well as us, we try things, uh, experiment balloons let's call them and some of the sometimes those balloons burst and we have a terrible disaster on our hands and other times they take off wonderful just like the bed springs and the trellises and you know a lot of people think oh I've got to go to the big box store and pay 50 or 60 dollars for some trellis when you probably have that item in the basement in the attic on jump day down the street you just gotta look for it and be creative and think out of the box oh definitely I have four kids and my husband works full-time, I work part-time. So we always are trying to find new ways of saving a buck. <laughs> Some people call it cheap, I call it frugal. <laughs> but yeah, I've taken right. dressers that I've found on the street and I'll take the drawers and grow in them and then I flip the whole dresser onto its back and use the inside to grow food and whatever I can. I, I don't think that you should waste anything and if we can keep it out of the landfill, that's even better. I even recycle all the cardboard. I put it under all my bark every year and to you know to keep the grass from popping in and we have that that wonderful crab grass and then that grass that grows a mile long and roots itself in different places and and it grows rampant out here because it's so hot and it'll just grow and grow. But you know, I've gotten a lot of stuff for my garden like rock and uh river rock and uh just different types of uh stones and stuff so that I can make pathways. I just hit Craigslist or I find free signs on the side of the road. I'll take anything you have if I can use it in the garden. <laughs> right, and you know, you were talking about using the cardboard. You've also used other unusual, uh, um, uh, thinking out of the box for mulch. You use sawdust, you use old peanut or nut shells whenever you, uh, you know, eat the nuts from them, the walnuts, the ha uh, cashews, all of those. Yeah, I've uh, we have almond trees around the corner from us. They surround a golf course, so they all fall to the ground. I go and we, my kids, I make them go to the side of the road. We harvest all the almonds and we use them in our baking for Christmas and stuff. And then I use all the shells in my garden as mulch to keep the weeds down. And it's really worked. We've even gotten a couple of almond sprouts out of it. And my daughter has one growing in a pot. It's only about three feet tall so far, but She's got her own almond tree going. We don't know if we'll get almonds, but hey, it was worth a try. <laughs> and the amount of money you're saving and baking by getting those free almonds is astronomical. Oh, definitely. I think last year we pulled in about 11 pounds of almonds just from them falling from the trees. You know, we save some for the squirrels. We have a lot of squirrels and stuff, and I'd rather them eat the almonds over there than be in my garden eating the fruits of my labor. <laughs> right. Right, so you know, you, you, you're a backyard gardener. You also have chickens. Now, in a lot of places, a lot of municipalities are accepting you know, a certain number of chickens in backyards. There's other cities that are still frowning upon that. We don't have time to discuss all those uh, reasons. But you have chickens. How many chickens do you have, and how long have you had them? Um, currently, right now, we just have three. Um, we've had up to six. We're not allowed to have roosters in our zone, which is fine because they're noisy. Um, we've had chickens on and off for about five years. I had them growing up, so I knew that I, eventually I wanted to reincorporate them. But we had to wait a few years for the city ordinance to lift it for us not having because we're right on the border of the country and right on the border of the city. So finally they allowed us to have chickens up to six but no roosters. 
Now, for somebody who is in an area where they can have chickens and have been thinking about it, what is the best piece of advice you can give somebody to push them over the edge and say, hey, yeah, let, let's go ahead and let's do this. Let's get chickens for the backyard since we're allowed to, and they give off fresh eggs. I would say call your county extension, call your your political leaders in your city and start hounding them. Get a petition going and just really try. We've had a couple of cities here where we've they finally allowed chickens because one person or individuals of a group have decided that they want chickens in their backyard for eggs. We are not allowed to raise meat chickens in our area, but we are allowed to have them for eggs. So, I mean, just start a petition. Ask your neighbor neighbors if they wouldn't mind if you had chickens and if you keep the pens clean they don't smell a lot of people think they smell we clean ours a couple times a month clean it out really good throw it in the compost and you're adding to what you already have and you'll get some really good soil from all that now are they are they fairly uh, maintenance free or is there some work that you've got to put into it? obviously you're cleaning the pen but do they basically take care of themselves for the most part Pretty much. I mean, I know I have friends who bathe their chickens. I don't go quite that far. <laughs> um, I do grow um, greens and different things for them and put them in their coop and let them peck at that and throw my excess garden waste and they, they eat that. We go snail hunting and look for them wonderful tomato hornworms and the chickens love to eat them. And at the end of the summer, I let my chickens run free through my garden and they dig it up. They turn the soil over for me and I it's pretty maintenance free free for me. So and, free. and to get and, and for chickens you want you, you just don't want one you want a group of them because they get lonely and they'll stop producing eggs correct on, on that? Oh definitely you, if you're gonna get chickens at least get two. I recommend more than two because you'll fall in love with them <laughs> and you know chickens they have a, their own personality and some will follow you around and just be your little sidekick and I mean, I do have to keep mine caged inside. I have a pen in the garden, and because I do have a dog, and she is a bird dog, <laughs> so she would get my chickens if they were unattended. But you know that I love having them. They're just they add character and personality to the garden, and they're so fun to go out and talk to every morning when you're feeding them. And you know, you just gotta keep the, give them fresh water daily and feed them and just clean out their cage and clean out their nest box, add new hay once in a while for them and they're happy, they're easy going. Now let's switch over back to, you, you talked about your traditional ground garden on your uh, your blog spots, you talk about growing in buckets. Now that's something that some people don't really understand because they think they've got to have this big pot, they've got to spend money buying this pot. Mm -hmm. You can grow in buckets as long as you have drainage holes and it's very effective and you can almost grow anything in a bucket that you could grow in the ground. Oh yeah, I mean I I grow in buckets, I grow in old teapots, I mean anything, even old crates and you know as long as they have drainage and you know you just it just depends on how much root depth you need for that vegetable that you're growing. You know, if you're going to you want to grow a tomato plant, you would need a big buck, you know, like a 5 gallon bucket so it had enough room for the roots to expand but if you're grow and growing some carrots you need you just need to make sure that you're growing in something that the roots have enough room to grow in but you can right. grow and, in and, and the nice thing about having a bucket if it's too cold outside you can bring the, ba the, the bucket in if it's you know yeah. warm outside you can set the bucket outside it, you're very flexible Oh yeah, and that's what I do. I grow at least three of my tomato plants in some type of container that I can drag into my greenhouse once it starts getting chilly here, which is about the end of October. You know, I can get cherry tomatoes into January just by moving it into the greenhouse. I mean, I won't get a lot, but I'll get something, and it's nice to have a t tomato in January. It gives you hope for the summer to come. <laughs> Right, and, and again, you're in central uh, northern California where your climate is much more milder than us here in Wisconsin oh, uh, yeah. over the winter months. It only gets yeah. to about 30 degrees here unless for some crazy reason we have a major cold snap, but yeah, it's pretty nice. I mean, some of us are still crazy enough to be wearing flip-flops in the middle of December, so it's nice. Well, what problems do you face in the garden? Obviously, you spoke of, you know, you're an organic gardener, no pesticides, no, you know, a Monsanto Roundup or any, any junk like that. What are some of the problems that you face on a, on, a yearly, on a yearly occurrence out in the garden now? I would say my biggest issue is usually aphids. 
aphids has always been my really big, huge issue. And I think with a lot of other pests too, as long as you have really good soil that you're growing in, I think you tend to not get as many bad pests, but you do. I, like last year I got squash bugs, vine borers in my front yard garden because that's where I grow most of my pumpkins and stuff like that. And that was the first year I had to deal with those types of bugs. But mostly it's aphids and I really try to, uh, I hand water everything so I look at everything and it's, it's a long process but to me it just, that's what I do because I don't use chemicals. But I do use Mupu in my garden and right. that's one of the best things I've ever used. And I even spray my foliage with it and I think that helps keep a lot of the bad bugs away too. Right, and also having a balance. So, you know, the, uh, uh, some of the uh, participants have been on this program, and some were trying. The A. Thatchers, the the James Prigionis, uh, they they talk about having a balance in the garden. If you have enough bad bugs, you're going to have enough good bugs, and everybody's going to be in sync the way nature intended. So you're not all you're not fighting it. The the nature will take care of itself. The balance will be there. Oh, definitely. And I think that every year a gardener has that one thing that doesn't do well for them. I mean, it, it changes every year. Like last year, I had a really bad tomato season. I got blight right away, and it was just our weather fluctuated so much, it was horrible. So I, I probably got five pounds of tomatoes. <laughs> and this year oh. I've had a really hard time with cucumbers because aphids just are destroying my cucumbers this year. I even went and bought ladybugs. and So I have a couple left that I'm hoping that I can just save just so I can get some pickles this winter, but they may have to come out too just because I and I don't want them to spread into my other stuff. Well, a wise old lady once told us at a food stand, if your garden can produce two vegetables over the summer months, you'll make it through the winter. And she was, you know, an 80-plus year old woman, so she was very knowledgeable about it, and she'd been gardening all her life and grew up through very bad times. So I take that advice very uh, to heart. You know, if I can just get two things to produce, I'm doing okay. Uh, I think that's great advice. <laughs> I, I, I have a little more than two things that are successful this year, but I didn't get a lot planted out this year, and I got my garden in about the second week of June because we redid our whole entire backyard. We put in a fire pit. So I lost a little bit of garden space, and we did put in some raised beds. And So this year I have a kind of a, a daily eating garden, I guess you would call it, and I did plant extra stuff that I would want for the winter, like my bread and butter pickles are, are a must-have, and some pickled peppers and jalapenos and stuff like that are definite must-haves for the winter months and early spring, but it's a smaller garden this year, and it's actually made it manageable for me to do all the other things that I'm involved in, And but next year, my front yard garden will go back in full tilt and we'll be back to hopefully canning about 200 pounds of food is what I try to go for every year. Well, let's talk about this front yard garden. You know, you, you're very uh, aware of it on, on the news across the country. A lot of cities are, are fighting against, you know, having people grow food in the front yard. What does your neighbors think and, and what is the city ordinance in your area? Is it, uh, do you fight a lot of issues with it or is everybody okay with that? Um, we haven't had any issues with it because we're like right on the cusp of rural country and then like three blocks over is a city and as long as I plant a lot of flowers in my border I don't think they really know what's inside in the middle I you know my I have a couple neighbors who think it's very awesome they're older and it reminds them of the Victory Garden era and so it gives them a lot of memories and they share stories with me and so I just I really try to plant a lot of flowers so that people really don't know what's going on inside because <laughs> one year I planted a bunch of tomatoes and they came and stole them all, roots and everything, pulled them right out of the ground. <laughs> and, well, and I think I think that's the thing, you know, it, it, whether you're doing it for fun, doing it for producing food, or doing it in a potential self-sufficient situation, if you plant vegetables that people are not familiar with what they are, if they're root vegetables, a kohlrabi, Swiss chard, it, it doesn't look edible to them and they will leave it alone. Obviously people know what tomatoes look like, peppers look like, but if you do something a little out of the box, most people just walk on by going, oh, look, look at that, some green foliage, and they'll keep on moving. Yeah, that, that is true, and that's why I try to plant, you know, taller variety flowers, and I have a lot of native plants 
to California in my area in my front yard and I have a couple of fruit trees that are just getting started and and that's what I've learned that I you know I plant tomatillos a lot of people don't know what those are and they think they're just like these little Chinese lanterns growing in your front yard and we grow a lot of basil and a lot of thyme and a lot of you know just different things that I know that people, unless they're a real big time gardener, that they're going to know. And you know, grow kale and Swiss chard and with my flowers so it looks flashy. And yeah, I, I've learned to hide it. I've even grown potatoes in my front yard because they think it's just a big bushy plant with a few flowers on it. So yeah, that's that was my hardest lesson to learn my first year doing a vegetable garden. And that year I just kind of stuck things here and there. and. So that was a good lesson for me of what not to plant so that people wouldn't take from my yard. <laughs> and I'm willing to share. All you have to do is come ask. Right, right. And that's the thing. Now, you, you spoke about you're a mother of four. Is the kids really interactive in the garden? Or some of them kind of went, hey, that's mom's thing. I'm just going to back away. Um, the first few years, um, my three, my older three are, you know, over the ages of 18 and are all out of school, but I do have a 10-year-old and she's very into gardening and she does the gardening program through her school and this year they're learning about native plants to California, so they'll be growing a native garden along with the vegetable garden and they'll be monitoring to see, um, you know, what kind of bugs and pollinators you have coming into your native garden that will help with your vegetable garden. So it's really good science and it incorporates and it gets them outside and so they can really play with the bugs and the stuff that they're growing and I think it's going to be a great learning tool this year. But she's my helper at home. She loves to plant. She likes to plant the whole package of tomatoes. Not understanding that we'll have 25 of the same one and really nowhere to put all of those in the one little box she's trying to plant them in. I give her her own box. She plants whatever she wants and it's actually pretty successful. We do pull a few tomatoes out. <laughs> but she picks about 10 things she wants for her garden and she comes in just as dirty as I. We're, we're always being told it's dinner time or mom are you making dinner tonight because you know it's 7 o'clock and we're starving and you're still out there playing in the right. dirt. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'll, I'll plan all of them now and then we'll worry about finding somewhere to put them later. Let's just get them started first. Uh, good yeah. mindset as a gardener. <laughs> and that's so let's, what let's talk about... Go ahead. And that's what we do, you know. In, the, in January we start planting a lot of our tomatoes. We'll put them out in the greenhouse. And they take a couple of weeks to germinate because it's, it's kind of cold in the greenhouse. It's not super warm. I don't have a heating system in it so it just kind of heats up as the sun comes out. So it takes a little longer, but I think the plants are stronger for it in the end. Right. So building building that structure from, from seedlings where, instead of, you know, letting them strengthen up and the weak ones die out so you have the right. strongest of the strong them. Yeah. Exactly. So strong so plants. Let's talk, about, let's talk about food storage first uh, before we have to end the program. You talked about canning, you know, 200 pounds of food. What are some of the things you can do? You water bath, uh, pressure can, freeze? What, what means of preserving do you follow there? Um, I do a lot of water bath canning and I do pressure can because we do a lot of fishing. So uh, during salmon season we do pressure can a lot of salmon so we can make salmon cakes in the middle of summer when we're miss or in the middle of winter when we're missing all that yummy fish in the summer and the fall. Um, we do a lot of dehydrating so we make soup mixes and um, we grow uh, different kinds of peppers and I grow paprika peppers so that I can make my own paprika every summer or from summer to winter and we make a lot of our own stuff we can uh, cucumbers we make our own tomato we can our tomatoes I'll make some marinara but I find it easier just to can the tomatoes and make it fresh as I'm cooking that night um, I do can chunks of squash or pressure can those and we do carrots and corn we freeze, some green beans we freeze, asparagus we freeze, and just different things like that. So my goal usually is about 200 pounds just in case. You never know in the winter what's going to happen or if we're going to lose power. And I do make applesauce as well and can other fruits as different seasons come about out here. Now during the winter, do you grow anything in the, in the, in the winter time and in cold frames in the greenhouse or you just focus on summer growing even though you're in somewhat of a mo more milder climate than we are? 
Um, in the winter, I do grow a lot of greens. I, I grow collard greens, and I grow broccoli, and I'm going to try my luck again at Brussels sprouts. I have yet to have any luck with Brussels sprouts <laughs> because we just don't get a cold enough freeze out here, and so it's really hard to grow Brussels sprouts, but I'm I'm going to do it. One of these days, I'm going to, it's going to happen. <laughs> I, I'm the optimistic gardener. Even if I fail, I'm going to keep on trying. But yeah, we grow a lot of the cool crops, and some I do cover, and some I do grow in the greenhouse, and and some can just be left out, like cabbage and stuff like that, because it doesn't get, it gets cold, but not enough to kill it. And, and my thought is, you know, it, it, depending on the level of gardening you are, but as a, as a gardener, there's always, no matter where you live, you always should be able and can plant something somewhere, somehow, in some form, whether it's a hot box, whether it's a greenhouse, whether it's a window seal, or in the ground garden during the summer months. Oh, definitely. And, and that's what I do, too. Like, my family, we're Italian, and we love our basil. And it's very hard to grow basil because basil loves a lot of heat. So you can't really grow that outside in the winter. So we bring it in, and I grow some basil under a heat mat that's in my kitchen. <laughs> and I have one of those arrow gardens. So I grow, you know, some little stuff in there too. But, yeah, we always we try to figure out a way and just keep on growing. We're hoping to... And growing herbs... Huh? And, and growing herbs in the kitchen, and growing herbs in the kitchen, regardless if you have ground or not, it, it's one of the simplest things that one uh, someone can do. Put in the windowsill. Oh yeah, definitely. We have a big skylight in our kitchen, so we have basically it looks like full sun in our kitchen, so we can grow them pretty much anywhere. But for some reason, I have a really hard time just growing basil, so I just put a little heat mat and I turn it on a couple hours every day in the winter time, and just to keep it growing. And I mean we come up with all kinds of ideas and this winter we're gonna focus on growing hydroponically and hoping to add some fish and growing that way uh, raising tilapia and doing some hydroponic with fish always taking the next step to be creative and experiment through, throughout the garden and growing me mediums and, and sources oh definitely and then we can also eat the fish down the line if you know we want to and but we're big fisher. We fish a lot, so we just want to try right. something new. Now, do you save seeds? Let's talk about save seed, seed saving here. And and you know, there's three types of seeds, and, and people hear this all the time. Save your heirloom seeds. Save your organic seeds. Don't save your hybrid seeds. Can people save hybrid seeds? Is it uh, really that bad of a thing, or or what? Um, I've never saved hybrid seeds because I have heard that that they don't produce the same the next time you grow that they're a little bit different genetically. So I've never really I've never saved hybrid seeds, so I don't know. But I do save open pollinated and heirloom seeds, and I do have an area of my yard that if that year I want to save that seed, I grow it away separately and I have it screened in. So and so I do that usually with one tomato every year. Um, I do work for a seed company, so. I kind of I do have access to seeds all the time, so I haven't done a lot of saving, but I mostly do save one tomato seed every year, and then I put them in a mason jar and put them in my freezer to hopefully you know keep them around for a while. And, and you say you know you spoke about genetics about the the hybrid seeds. We're not talking about GMOs. We're talking about the natural hibernation that the two seeds two varieties cross and make a seed and we're not talking about the DNA uh, structures changed in that seed. Oh, yeah. I I don't I just haven't really looked too much into the hybrid seeds, so I don't really know a lot about hybrid seeds. And at the school gardens we do we do teach and promote a lot about heirloom and open pollinated because that we think that's something that we should really stress to them. And we have also taught them to buy seeds from reputable countries. Uh, companies that are signing the Safe Seed Pledge and are part of the, the Safe Seed Alliance, I think that's very important because you don't want to be bringing GMO seeds into your garden. And even though most of the companies that sell seeds to, you know, backyard gardeners and this and that, they aren't touched by genetically modified. Is well, that's what they say. But I still search out organic companies or people that sign that safe seed pledge because that just gives me better peace of mind and I'd rather support those countries or companies than the other companies that are just evil bad like Monsanto. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
and, and 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 seeds equal power. And you know, we've spoke. I've spoke about this on, on many occasions on this program. When you have the seeds, you have the power. And when you have the power, you can produce the food that you need to survive. Exactly, and that's I do. I do try to store. Um, it, 10 to 15 different varieties of seed that are heirloom open pollinated and I do freeze them and you know as I want to use them I stick them in my fridge and let them you know start the defrosting period and I'll plant them out and I've had seeds that have lasted me nine years and they still germinate a hundred percent so I right. think if you just safely store your seeds and you know take care of that that I think people should be saving their own seed it really worries me that People are messing so much with our seeds and our products that you're not going to be able to find a true seed, and that's that's right. kind of scary. Right, and that's the thing, uh, you know, saving those seeds to hold in the power so you can be self-sustainable. Uh, Jennifer, I appreciate you coming on the program. A lot of great information that you provided for the viewers, and I will have all the your social media links in the show notes below following live broadcast so they can like you on Facebook, they can read your blog spot uh, post since you're a blogger as well and uh, thank you for coming on the program. Well thank you for having me Joey and tell Holly I said hi and you guys have a wonderful evening. Uh, I will do so. Till next time everybody if you like what you see hit that like button below for Jennifer Hammer I'm Joey Baird reminding you till next time stay in the know so you're always prepared. See you next time everybody. <laughs>